Retail lectures is one of the most important item types in your speaking. The reason being that retail lecture not only carries your scores into your speaking section but also into your listening section. If you are giving the PT test and you're aiming for really high scores in your listening as well as your speaking, you need to get your retail lectures absolutely correct, not only in terms of your speech but also in terms of your content. Hence, content recognition is very important over here. The following video that you're about to watch is Alchemist Academy's prediction file for retail lectures for the month of April 2021. I highly recommend that when you're going through this video, please focus on content recognition and make sure that you focus and understand on how to get the content from the lectures. In case, if you don't know how to recognize the content or if you've got any issues regarding content recognition, there is a link given at the bottom of this video. It is a webinar done by me. Uh, which helps you to recognize content for detailed lectures. If you still have any questions or queries and you would still like to get them like solved by us or you know ask us directly, please feel free to contact us through our main page on Facebook, which is Alchemist Academy, or you can give us a call on the displayed numbers on the screen. Thank you so much and good luck for your test. Alchemist Academy PTE and Naughty Training Center Retail Lecture April 2021 Prediction File. Retail Lecture Set 1. Today we're going to recount heroic tales of superhuman feats of strength, when in the face of disaster, some people are said to have summoned up incredible physical power to lift a car off of an accident victim, move giant rocks, or like Big John of Song, single-handedly hold up a collapsing beam to let the other miners escape. Are such stories true? There are many anecdotes supporting the idea, but we're going to take a fact-based look at whether or not it truly is possible for an adrenaline-charged person to temporarily gain massive strength. In proper terminology, such a temporary boost of physical power would be called hysterical strength. The stories are almost always in the form of one person lifting a car off of another. And even lifting many cars by several inches still leaves most of its weight supported by the suspension springs. But our purpose today is not to debunk any of these specific stories. The majority of them are anecdotal, and interestingly, not repeatable. In many cases, the person who summoned the super strength later tried it again only to find that they couldn't do it. Basically, what we have is a respectably large body of anecdotal evidence that suggests that in times of crisis, danger, or fear, some people have the ability to temporarily exercise superhuman strength. The skoog is a new universally accessible musical instrument. It is designed to use by children or adults with special needs or in fact be used by anyone. It's soft, it's easy to play, it's robust and it can be customized to suit anyone's abilities. The skoog helps students with special needs by allowing them to get involved in making music themselves. It's an instrument that they can play it and they can take ownership of and start creating their own sounds and music. Traditional instruments are the shape and size and made of the materials they are because of the sound that they need to make. If you want to make a sound like a plucked string, you need a string and it needs to be under tension, whereas with a skoog, because it's a mixture of software and a sensor, then thus the computer can handle making the sound. And so we can design an object that's designed to be touched and designed to be played with. In developing the screen and working with kids in the schools and in the classrooms, it's really helped us make the Skoog something that's usable by the children themselves. They've informed us massively on how it needs to work and they've given their opinions on colors and designs. And just the feedback they've given to us has been just marvelous.
It's just so enriching and it's really inspiring to actually work with these kids, particularly when you can provide them with an ability to start to playing their own music as opposed to just taking part through listening and listening to other musicians and really learning from. Let's say if I'm asking which source do you often use to get information. Newspaper, radio, TV, and the survey shows 62% of the people chose internet. You might be thinking I am going to say how important the internet is, or how quickly it has changed the world for a few years. But what if I tell you this survey is conducted on the website globalandmail.com? Our answer will be different. Because the people who did this survey on a website must be frequent users of internet. This sample is a biased sample. So we have to pay attention to how a survey is conducted. Retail Lecture Set 2 As Joanne pointed out, only one country, tiny little Bhutan, wedged between China and India, has adopted the gross national happiness as the central index of government policy, and actually has a good deal of success in education and in health and in economic growth and in environmental preservation. They have a rather sophisticated way of measuring the effects of different policies on people's happiness. They are the only country to go that far. But you are now beginning to get other countries interested enough to do kind of white paper policy analyses of happiness research, what effects would it have if we used it more for public policy? You are beginning to get countries like Australia, France, Great Britain, that are considering publishing regular statistics on happiness. So it is beginning to become a subject of greater interest for policymakers and legislators in different advanced countries. Computer scientist Shwetak Patel and his team are developing new sensing systems. The initial focus was really around energy and water monitoring. They built a new generation of smart sensors that monitor electronic interference on a home's power line or water pressure changes in the plumbing. 
Most of this technology has already found industrial applications, and Patel and his team turn their attention to adapting the technology for personal health monitoring. So how do we take this noise and make it into a signal of interest was kind of the, kind of the, the core of what we did for many years, and we're taking that work and, and applying it to other domains. They're looking to take advantage of all the functionality built into our smartphones. With the user's permission, this app can use the microphone built into most smartphones to listen to background noises, <coughs> such as coughing, searching for patterns that suggest a trip to the doctor might be in order. We construct these models that try and understand uh, how sound works, how it, um, what its patterns are, and we give it a whole bunch of examples of different kinds of audio, things like um, people talking, things like people laughing, sneezing, and of course coughing. This app uses a phone's camera to check hemoglobin levels in blood by analyzing the color of capillary fluids through the skin. Generally, what happens is if you're anemic, your blood's going to be a little less red. And we take advantage of that by putting your finger over a camera of a phone. The camera of the phone can actually see the coloration of the blood. And this test uses the camera to help parents worried about jaundice in newborn infants. Now, jaundice is something that doctors who have seen tons of babies can just kind of figure out on a very basic level of, is this baby, do they need a treatment, or are they in a good condition? Whereas a first-time parent has no idea necessarily what jaundice might look like. The researchers say the built-in sensors found in smartphones are already commonplace, but their applications and their implications for our health and well-being may be more far-reaching than we ever imagined. So that creates tensions and that's what I want to talk about. Because I think it's important that we are, as a society, able to have an informed debate about how much privacy is enough but not too much, how much security is enough but not too much. Privacy, as a human right, that's simply quoting the Universal Declaration. In the physical world, we've got all kinds of protections. There is evidence that we care about our privacy. We've got locks, we've got obscured glass, we've got lots, we wear clothes, we put up shutters. And technology continues to erode the privacy that exists in the real world, in the three spatial dimensions. Security cameras, automatic number, plate recognition take away anonymity. Long lenses, paparazzi, take away distance and the privacy that used to create. And body scanners are increasingly being used to see through for example. This process isn't going to slow down and the new quantum technologies are actually being able to do gravitational sensing. And that's advancing at a remarkable rate. And you can't shield gravity. So some of the new quantum technologies are able already to see through walls. And there are technologies also for seeing round corners now using scattered light from lasers. Technology continues to erode privacy. Retail Lecture Set 3 
there's sugar in a lot of foods where you don't expect it. And of course, you know, there's lots of sugar in donuts or ice cream or pastries or other things that are sweet, candy, of course. But there are other places where you see it and you don't necessarily expect it. So as an example, peanut butter. Here's a list of ingredients from Skippy peanut butter. And you see that sugar is the second most common ingredient. <coughs> Excuse me, you may know from reading food labels that these ingredients in any food label are listed in, in order of how much there is in the food itself. So sugar comes right after peanuts. Here's another example, beef stew. You wouldn't necessarily expect to find sugar in beef stew, but it's there. Now it's down the list of ingredients. It's actually toward the end. But if you look at the marketing of this and look at the can, it says there's fresh potatoes and carrots, but actually there's more sugar in this than there is carrots. Welcome to today's lesson. We are continuing with the study of taxonomy. Taxonomy is how scientists classify organisms into different groups based on the characteristics that they share. So for instance, a good way to think about taxonomy is the US Postal Service. If we want to send a letter to someone, we first start off by addressing it to the nation they are in. By default, we usually assume that's America, but it doesn't have to be. It could be England or Costa Rica or Spain. Either way, you put their nation or their kingdom first. And within that kingdom, you address it to a slightly more specific level, their states. So for instance, South Carolina will be the same as a phylum. Within that state, you would address it to their city, and then to the street number, and the street they live on. Then you would address it to, say, their apartment complex, and within that complex, you address it by their last name to their family, and then finally, their first name to the specific person you want to get it to. And in that way, we are able to weed out all the 400 million people we don't want to send our letter to in America, and pinpoint the exact person we want the letter to reach. In the same way, scientists use a taxonomy chart to pinpoint a living creature and organism and how it relates to everything else in the world. When we talk about the polar regions, just to clarify exactly what we mean, um, we have first of all the Arctic at the top of the Earth and the Antarctic at the bottom. Um, so the Arctic was named um, after the Greek word for bear. Now surprisingly it's not after the polar bears that live in the, Antarct uh, live in the Arctic, um, but it's after the little and great bear constellations that can be seen in the sky. Now the Greeks also hypothesized that there would be an anti-Arctic, which is how we get the name Antarctica, and that of course it wasn't discovered until much later on. 
Now these regions are opposite in many ways other than just their names and their location on the globe. Um, so if we look at the Arctic first of all, um, the Arctic is actually ocean surrounded by land. Um, so we can see here, this is the UK down here, and this is kind of Russia, and then America and Canada around here. Um, so there is a bit of land covered in ice in the, in the Arctic, which is Greenland here. Um, but mostly all this area here, surprisingly a lot of people don't realise that this isn't actually land. The North Pole isn't on land, it's just one big ocean. Retail Lecture Set 4 This is a kind of object that you're probably all familiar with when you, when you hear the term robot. But I'm going to show you the very, very first robots. These were the very first robots. Uh, they were characters in a play in the 1920s called Rothen's Universal Robots. And they, uh, the play was written by a Czech writer called Karol Čapák. And basically, um, these robots, uh, you know, people tend to think of robots as kind of cute, cuddly toys or, you know, Hollywood depictions kind of devoid of politics. But the first robots were actually created and imagined in a time of absolute political turmoil. You just had the First World War. Um, you know, finish that had a devastating impact uh, across Europe, and um, so pe people were kind of, and people were kind of reflecting on what does it mean to be human, what makes us human, those kind of questions. And this kind of context is what inspired Chapek to kind of uh, write this play. And um, interestingly, these robots being human. Uh, they are actually in the play assembled on a production line, a bit like uh, the Ford manufacturing uh, production line. So even though they are human, they are assembled and these robots are designed to labour and that is their uh, primary purpose in society. The infinite monkey theorem states that a monkey hitting keys at random on a typewriter keyboard for an infinite amount of time will almost surely type a given text, such as the complete works of William Shakespeare. In this context, almost surely is a mathematical term with a precise meaning, and the monkey isn't actually a monkey but a metaphor for an abstract device that produces a random sequence of letters ad infinitum. So the theorem illustrates the perils of reasoning about infinity by imagining a vast but finite number and vice versa. The probability of a monkey exactly typing a complete work such as Shakespeare's Hamlet is so tiny that the chance of it occurring during a period of time 
of the order of the age of the universe is minuscule, but not zero. But technologies can help monkeys to write. If the monkeys are given a pen and some papers to spell the word monkey, they can only scratch it on the paper. By contrast, though, if they were given a typewriter, it will take them over 10 years to produce the right spelling. However, if they can use computer programming, they can finish a task within a day, maybe. Vitamin D refers to a group of fat-soluble secosteroids responsible for increasing intestinal absorption of calcium, iron, magnesium, phosphate, and zinc. In humans, the most important compounds in this group are vitamin D3 and vitamin D2. D3 and D2 can be ingested from the diet and from supplements. Very few foods contain vitamin D synthesis of vitamin D in the skin as the major natural source of the vitamin. Demel synthesis of vitamin D from cholesterol is dependent on sun exposure, specifically UVB radiation. Vitamin D from the diet or dermal synthesis from sunlight as biologically inactive activation requires enzymatic conversion in the liver and kidney. Evidence indicates the synthesis of vitamin D from sun exposure is regulated by a negative feedback loop that prevents toxicity, but because of uncertainty about the cancer risk from sunlight, no recommendations are issued by the Institute of Medicine US for the amount of sun exposure required to meet vitamin D requirements. Retail Lecture Set 5 A non-governmental organization is an organization that is neither a part of a government nor a conventional for-profit business. Usually set up by ordinary citizens, NGOs may be funded by governments, foundations or businesses. Some avoid formal funding altogether and are run primarily by volunteers. NGOs are highly diverse groups of organizations engaged in a wide range of activities, and take different forms in different parts of the world. Some may have charitable status, while others may be registered for tax exemption based on recognition of social purposes. Others may be funds for political, religious or other interest groups. The number of NGOs operating in the United States is estimated at 1.5 million. Russia has 277,000 NGOs. India is estimated to have had around 2 million NGOs in 2009, just over one NGO per 600 Indians, and many times the number of primary schools and primary health centers in India. NGOs are difficult to define, and the term NGO is not used consistently. As a result, there are many different classifications in use. The most common focus is on orientation and level of operation. An NGO's orientation refers to the type of activities it takes on. 
These activities might include human rights, environmental, or development work. An NGO's level of operation indicates the scale at which an organization works, such as local, regional, national or international. They call it the marshmallow test. A four to six year old child sits alone in a room at a table facing a marshmallow on a plate. The child is told, if you don't eat this treat for 15 minutes, you can have both it and the second one. Kids on average wait for five or six minutes before eating a marshmallow. The longer a child can resist the treat, however, has been correlated with a higher general competency later in life. Now, a study shows that ability to resist temptation isn't strictly innate. It is also highly influenced by environment. Researchers gave a five-year-old used crayons and one sticker to decorate a sheet of paper. One group was promised a new set of art supplies for the project, but they never received it. On the other hand, the other group did receive new crayons and better stickers. Then both groups were given the marshmallow test. The children who had been lied to waited for a mean time of three minutes before eating the marshmallow. The group that got their promised materials resisted an average of 12 minutes. Thus, the researchers note that experience factors into a child's ability to delay gratification. When previous promises have been hollow, why believe the next one? Let's take a look at this video of these little kids. They were offered the option of having one marshmallow immediately or two marshmallows 15 minutes later. And you've got some very cute videotape of this experiment, so let's take a look. Okay. What we found is um, a very simple and direct way of measuring a competence that seems to make an important life difference. A researcher tells these preschoolers that she's going to leave the room. If they wait for her to come back without eating the marshmallows, they'll get two marshmallows. Mm. Or they can ring the bell and she'll come back right away. But then they only get one marshmallow. I won't ring the bell. You won't ring the bell? Okay. <laughs> Looking at 
with children over time, Dr. Michelle has found that being able to wait longer at four has some pretty powerful implications. And what are those powerful implications? Is that uh, that later in life they're more disciplined and have more self-control? Is that pretty much it? Well, they are more likely to achieve their life goals. They have better relationships. They did better on their SAT tests. I know, that's they, crazy. All because they waited 15 minutes for well, two marshmallows? I mean, I think it is crazy. I probably would have eaten all three. But <laughs> Yeah, me too. <laughs> but, um, you know, actually, yes. Uh, the ability to be able to to pursue your goals, in this case it was to have two marshmallows versus one, and not go on automatic and just grab the marshmallow, is a very important skill. But I think a main point in Mind in the Making is that these skills can be caught, taught if you're 14 or 40 or, or 4. It's not ever too late and any child can learn them, any adult can teach them and it's never too late. Retail Lecture Set 6 The shuttle was designed to be a space truck. It's a multi-purpose vehicle. We've done a tremendous number of different things with it. It's the most versatile space vehicle that has ever been built. We've used it to launch satellites. We've used it to repair satellites in orbit and put them back into orbit. We've used it to capture satellites and bring them back to Earth for repair. We've outfitted it with the Space Lab built by our European partners and used it before the era of the space station to do scientific research. We used it as part of our partnership with the Russians, which is still continuing, first as part of the Mir space station, where we actually prolonged the useful life of Mir by several years through logistical supply visits with the shuttle. And now, of course, we're using it to build the new International Space Station, which is a, a huge international partnership. The historic town of Mostar, spanning a deep valley of the Nevada River, developed in the 15th and 16th centuries as an Ottoman frontier town, and also during the Austro-Hungarian period in the 19th and 20th centuries. Mostar has long been known for its old Turkish houses and old bridge, Stari Most, after which it is named. In the 1990s conflict, however, most of the historic town and the old bridge 
designed by the renowned architect Sinan, was destroyed. The old bridge was recently rebuilt and many of the edifices in the old town have been restored or rebuilt with the contribution of an international scientific committee established by UNESCO. The old bridge area with its pre-Ottoman, Eastern Ottoman, Mediterranean and Western European architectural features is an outstanding example of a multicultural urban settlement. The reconstructed old bridge and old city of Mostar is a symbol of reconciliation, international cooperation and the coexistence of diverse cultural, ethnic and religious communities. I think with our linguistic training, we also get all this invisible training to be authorities, to be the people who know. It is part of that process that you come out as a world authority on your chosen subject. But when we move into working with communities, we have to recognise that the communities have to be the authority in their language. And actually, um, a woman in the class I'm teaching at Sydney at the moment, a Korea woman, expressed this very nicely, although she was talking about something else. She was distinguishing expertise from authority. And certainly linguists, because of our training, we do have expertise in certain very narrow areas of language. But we don't have the authority over what to do with that knowledge or what to do with other knowledge that the community produces. And I guess for me, the bottom line is languages are lost because of the dominance of one people over another. And that's not rocket science. It's, <laughs> it's not hard to work that out. But then what that means is if in working with language revival, we continue to hold the authority, we actually haven't done anything towards undoing how languages are lost in the first place. So we've, in, in a sense, the languages are still lost if the authority is still lost. Retail Lecture Set 7 Wilson came then from a different world and he became the focal point of a broad mainstream American culture that thought that modern literature and wanted modern literature to be able to be read and appreciated by ordinary people. They were not modernists in an abstract sense, and certainly some of them, like T.S. Eliot and Faulkner, were too difficult for some of their writings to be read by ordinary people. But this was a world before the division between the brows, or 
between elite or whatever had established itself as part of our consciousness. Wilson was a major player in the successful effort of his generation to establish at the heart of American life an innovative literature that would equal the great cultures of Europe. And he knew that the great cultures of Europe were there. He was not a product of a narrow American studies kind of training at all. He joined a high artistic standard with an openness to all experience and a belief that literature was as much a part <coughs> of life for everyone as conversation. He thought that Proust and Joyce and Yeats and Eliot could and should be read by ordinary Americans and help that to happen. Wilson was a very various man. Over a period of almost 50 years, he was a dedicated a literary journalist, an investigative reporter, a brilliant memoirist, and dedicated journal keeper. In order to survive and thrive in specific environments, animal species along with plants and other organisms have developed a host of amazing characteristics that help them find food, protect themselves, cope with tough environments, and reproduce. Some of these are physical characteristics like sharp beaks, bright coloration, or body types that can take advantage of thermals and updrafts. Others are behavioral. These include building nests, communicating with one another, and ways of finding food. Migration is a behavioral adaptation central to this project. These adaptations don't happen overnight, they are slow, gradual changes that can take hundreds of thousands of years to evolve. If an animal has a particular physical characteristic or behavior that enables it to survive when others in its species are less likely to, that trait gets passed on to its offspring and to future generations. This activity helps set the stage for students to think about how their journey north species are adapted to get by in different environments. No one knows who invented the button. It might have shown up as early as 2000 BCE. It was decorative when it first started, just something pretty sewn onto your clothes. Then about 3000 years later, someone finally invented the buttonhole and buttons were suddenly useful. The button and the buttonhole is such a great invention. Not only does it slip through the buttonhole, but then it kind of like falls into place. And so you're completely secure, like it's never gonna open. The design of a button hasn't changed much much since the Middle Ages. It's one of the most enduring designs in history. For me, the best buttons are usually round. There's either a dome button with a little shank or there's just this sort of like round thing with either a rim or not a rim, either two holes or four holes. Almost more important than the button is the button hole. And the way you figure that out is the diameter of the button plus the width of the button plus a little bit of ease. Before buttons, clothes were bigger 
They were more kind of amorphous. And people like wriggled into them or like just kind of wrapped themselves in things. But then fashion moved closer to the body as we discovered uses for the butt. At one time, it was the one way to make clothes fit against the body. I think the reason buttons have endured for so long historically is because they actually work to keep our clothes shut. Zippers break, Velcro makes a lot of noise and it wears out after a while. If a button falls off, you just literally sew that thing on. A button is kind of there for the long run. It's not just the most elemental design ever. It's also such a crazy fashion statement. Retail Lecture Set 8 Since before the first moon landings of 1969, there has been interest in space travel to the moon. Lunar programs are expensive and difficult, but there are several reasons why the moon might be a good place to launch further space exploration. Firstly, a moon launch base would eliminate the most difficult aspect of space travel, namely, getting a rocket through the Earth's gravity. The journey time between, say, going to Mars from Earth, rather than from the Moon, is not significant. However, the cost difference would be immense, as it would take 20 times less fuel to launch a spacecraft from the Moon than from the Earth, due to there being less gravity on the Moon. There would not need to be a drain on the Earth's resources, as the Moon is rich in all the necessary minerals, such as aluminium and silicon, which would mean that the entire infrastructure needed to enable spacecraft launch from the Moon could be done robotically using the materials already present. Smoking costs more than the life of an individual. It can affect the health of an entire country. The World Health Organization says low-income countries depend heavily on taxes from cigarettes. They use the money, in part, to pay the costs of health care for tobacco-related diseases. But the illegal trade in tobacco products is further testing the economies of low-income countries. WHO officials say the illegal trade earns about $31 billion every year. Douglas Betcher is the director of the WHO's Department for the Prevention of Noncommunicable Diseases. He calls the illegal trade a monster with many heads. He says the trade enables young people to buy cigarettes at low prices, become addicted to tobacco, and suffer serious health problems. It also increases crime and reduces tax revenue. The World Health Organization is urging the United Nations member states to sign a treaty to end the illegal trade in tobacco products. 
eight countries have approved the treaty. But the approval of 32 other countries is needed for it to become international law. If the treaty succeeds, governments could put people who trade illegal tobacco products in jail, another cost to countries' budgets. Well, there's a number of ways to think about what dimensions are. I hope we all know where three dimensions are, which you can say are left, right, forward, backward, up, down. And if you think about it, three, we say there are three dimensions of space. And sometimes we need three coordinates to locate some objects in space. So you can say longitude, latitude, and altitude. So if there were more dimensions, you would need more coordinates. Now, of course, for whatever reason, we are not physiologically designed to observe those dimensions. But that doesn't mean they don't exist. One way of thinking about it is, maybe the best way of thinking about it is, the way that someone named Edwin Abbott did in the late 19th century in a book called Flatland. And he said, suppose there were two-dimensional creatures living in a two-dimensional universe. They would have the same trouble conceptualizing three dimensions that we have when we try to conceptualize more than three, such as four. And so, he asked questions like, what would observers in this two-dimensional universe see, say, if a three-dimensional object like a sphere passed through the universe? And what this flatland universe would see would be a series of disks that grow in size and then decreased in size in the same way that we can certainly think about a two-dimensional world inside a three-dimensional world it could be that we observe three dimensions but really there are more and if a hypersphere say a four-dimensional sphere passed through our universe we could see a series of spheres that grew in size and then decreased in size the fact that we don't observe those extra dimensions doesn't mean they don't exist and they are hard to conceptualize they certainly are hard to visualize but we can think about them mathematically and conceptually without Retail Lecture Set 9 But Aristotle says the reason we need rhetoric is we have to be able to use it. We have to be able to use rhetoric influence, basically, the rebel, and the morons. We try to get them to understand truth. Truth is suggested, is diarrant than rhetoric. Rhetoric is the dressing, is the body, right. Truth is the spirit, is the soul, is abstract. It doesn't have a body. It's not particular. If you want to get somebody to the truth, you might have to use some kind of tricks. Right. Because most people are not sound and can't see the truth. That's what we think. Most people are ramble. Really. Only the educated be erudite are actually capable of seeing the truth. If you want to get the general mass there, you may have to do fable a little bit. So Aristotle that is rhetoric. Rhetoric is something that is used to influence people. Right. And it's a kind of mentally promised a logic.
Okay. If I asked about the earliest thing you can remember, I'll bet for most of you your earliest memory would be from about age three, right? Well, that's true for most adults. We can't remember anything that happened before the age of three. And, and this phenomenon is so widespread and well documented, it has a name. It's called childhood amnesia and was first documented in 1893. As I said, this phenomenon refers to adults not being able to remember childhood incidents. It's not children trying to remember events from uh, last month or, or last year. Of course it follows that if you can't remember an incident as a child, you probably won't remember it as an adult. Okay? So, so, so why is this? What are the reasons for a childhood amnesia? Well, once a popular explanation was that childhood memories are repressed, or the memories are disturbing, so that as adults we keep them buried. And so we can't recall them. And this is based on, well, well, it's not based on, on, on the kind of solid research and lab testing I want to talk about today. So, so let's put that explanation aside and concentrate on just two. Okay? It could be that as children we do form memories of things prior to age three, but forget them as we grow older. Well, that's one explanation. Another possibility is that children younger than three lack a, lack some cognitive capacity for memory. And that idea, uh, that children are unable to form memories, uh, that's been the dominant belief in psychology for the past hundred years. And this idea is very much tied to two things, the theories of Jean Piaget and also to language development in children. The other thing that this tablet tells us a little about, about, as I've mentioned, is the fact that writing is hugely important in Roman London, and it's something which really marks it out uh, within the context of Roman Britain. Uh, here we, we have um, in excess of 500 examples of wooden writing tablets surviving, many, many other inscriptions. An awful lot of them are to do with this whole kind of idea of commerce, of business transactions, um, an awful lot of it the written texts are two of the Roman army, and that's precisely because writing in a society that where literacy rates would have been significantly lower than they were today uh, was really a tool of power. And things like these fat, rather fancy metal ink wells, um, which have been found in a number of sites in London, I think really reflect that. And they're, in fact, they're, within Britain, they're quite heavily concentrated here. Retail Lecture Set 10 
The salt trade has existed for thousands of years and arguably has played an even greater role in shaping the world's economic and social history than products like silk, cotton or spices. Salt mining is still hugely important today and there are three basic ways that salt can be extracted from oceans or underground sources. So, starting with probably the earliest method, which is solar evaporation. This method is used to extract salt from seawater. Basically, seawater is collected in shallow pools. The seawater dries out when it's exposed to sun and wind. When this happens, a layer of salt is left behind which can be cleaned and harvested. A newer technique is solution mining. This method uses a water solution to extract salt from underground rock sources. Water is injected into the rock and absorbs the salt. The salty liquid is then pumped back to the surface where the salt can be extracted at a processing plant. Finally, deep shaft mining is similar to other types of mineral mining. Here, pieces of rock containing the salt are drilled away from the mine shaft. These pieces are then crushed into smaller chunks and transported to the top for processing. All right, while we're on the topic of economics, let's talk about another term called market clearing price. I know it may sound difficult, but it is actually pretty straightforward. As a matter of fact, it simply means equilibrium, or when a market is clear of shortage and surplus. If we were to use a market graph, the market clearing price is found at the point where the demand curve and the supply curve meet. I am sure you feel that this is over your head, but I will try my best to simplify it. To start off with, I will talk about price. Real prices of different commodities such as gold, oil and gas depend very much on how much they are in demand and how much is available or in supply. The relationship between supply and demand cannot be made independently by suppliers and consumers. Instead, a free market allows prices to move towards equilibrium or market clearing prices. This situation sounds too perfect, doesn't it? Well, it is. So let's add in some other factors to the mix. Let's suppose that the government, or worse, an underground mob, fixes prices by force. This would negatively affect our free market scenario and would result in supply surpluses or shortages. A surplus occurs when prices are set too high and there is extra supply of something like unemployment, which is simply an excess supply of labor. On the other hand, shortages can occur when prices are set too low and there is a limited amount of supply. Now, all important in making measurements, which is always ignored in every college book, 
is the uncertainty in your measurement. Any measurement that you make without any knowledge of the uncertainty is meaningless. I will repeat this. I want you to hear it tonight at 3 o'clock when you wake up. Any measurement that you make without a knowledge of its uncertainty is completely meaningless. My grandmother used to tell me that, at least she believed it, that someone who is lying in bed is longer than someone who stands up. And in honor of my grandmother, I'm going to bring this today to a test. I have here a setup where I can measure a person standing up and a person lying down. It's not the greatest bed, but lying down. I have to convince you about the uncertainty in my measurements, because a measurement without knowledge of the uncertainty is meaningless. And therefore what I will do is the following. I have here an aluminum bar, and I make the reasonable, plausible assumption that when this aluminum bar is sleeping, when it is horizontal, that it is not longer than when it is standing up. If you accept that, we can compare the length of this aluminum bar with this setup and with this setup.